Okay, I'm on here. okay so uh, this is really um, kind of screwed. So let's do it. Can we all just, if you're that side of the screens, just stand up. Come, there's loads of space here because uh, I've got a couple of bits of video to show. And uh, when the sun comes out, it's really difficult to see. So if you just come a bit closer. And uh, what we actually have here is not a problem. It's an opportunity to uh, come and meet some other people. Come on, don't, don't hang at the back there. Come, there's loads of fun going on down here. That's it. Just move a little bit closer. Okay. No problem. All right. Well, and we'll manage one way or another. Uh, we'll kind of do it in Braille and I'll describe what's on the screen. Thanks. Okay, can you, uh, so you can hear me okay. Thanks very much for doing that. And uh, apologies for the, uh, uh, for the glitch there. So my name's Derek Scafell. Um, uh, I'm uh, just going to talk about um, some stuff that I've done, trying to do one project, and I've kind of deviated off and found a, one or two other interesting things that have gone on uh, around my house. Um, just to give you um, a very, yeah, I just want to kind of set the, set the scene here. Um, I, I know no electronics. Um, and I know no electronics because I'm a, I'm a biologist, really. Um, so I, I do agricultural physiology and crop protection. And um, this, uh, the, the bottom left uh, picture here on the screen is, is kind of corn growing in polytunnels that we check. And I, I work with a lot of data to do with experiments that come out of that. So I don't really do electronics by any means. Um, and the other thing that, I've, uh, that is relevant to this uh, that I've, I've recently been doing is I've been doing some welding. And on the bottom right there, again, I'll have to kind of describe it to you, but it's, um, this is a, a three bottles of beer which I gave to my neighbour's son when he reached 18 years old, but I welded them all into a steel case. So the only way he could get into it was to actually take an angle grinder or a hacksaw to it <laughs> if he actually wanted a drink of beer. Um, so that... <laughs> yeah. Yes, or break the bottle. And it's teasingly made to look as if you can just take the bottle out, but actually, when you try, um, you, you find out you can't do it. So, uh, yeah, so my background is I don't really know anything about electronics, and um, uh, I, I just became very interested in the Raspberry Pi. Actually, when my son got one for Christmas, he'd asked for one for Christmas. Um, my son's quite old, actually. Um, he's 23. But, um, and uh, I, I thought it was very interesting, but um, Ebon Upton's... Uh, 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 background and understanding of why we actually needed the Raspberry Pi I th really resonated with me. I'm definitely from the generation that couldn't afford a BBC Micro, but you know, uh, did use one, used friends ones, and I did a lot of programming and bits and pieces with that. And I think that um, yeah, I, I totally understand his his statements about or understanding that the number of graduate also potential graduates who are applying for courses who actually have an understanding of computer science has declined and declined and declined in the UK. Uh, and that has been a real shame, and that's not necessarily going to set us well for the future. It's not really things that are going to build our computer science capabilities in the UK. Um, and, you know, with national curriculums being full of uh, Excel, uh, things, how to do PowerPoint presentations and how to do Excel, is not really the thing that's going to push forward the frontiers for us. So I think... Um, you know, the, the Raspberry Pi is just a brilliant, brilliant uh, uh, phenomena that, that's come about. And uh, I, I, I never cease to be amazed by these projects. Um, this, I mean, everyone knows this one with Babbage the Bear. Um, you know, with, uh, oh, sorry, I better describe the picture because you won't be able to see it. The sun's come out. But um, I'm talking about Babbage the Bear, the, um, the project to uh, but, uh, recreate um, Felix Baumgarten's jump from outer space, but using a teddy bear and a Raspberry Pi. Uh, you know, a total budget three hundred pounds, whereas uh, the NASA budget for Felix Baumgarten's budget was thirty million. Um, but you know, it's just we'll write on one for the open source crowd to actually uh, actually do that. And uh, you know, the school projects that you see for the Raspberry Pi, I think, are amazing as well. It's just really great ideas that they come up with: cap feeders, pill dispensers, uh, lap timers, sports equipment, all powered by Raspberry Pi projects. So, um, I. I found that really interesting, and I, I tend to um, try and find little things that, that I can do around the house. And one of the things, again, I'm going to have to describe, I can't believe the sun's come out, it's been cloudy all week. Um, so I'll describe this to you. On the right-hand side here, in this blank piece of uh, uh, screen, is a pile of builder's debris, 
which has been dumped on a byway near, our, uh, near where I live. Uh, and a friend of mine is the estate manager for a number of farms around here. And this fly tipping that occurs is, um, is a real pain. It's a real pain to him because he, he's the landowner and has to clear all this up. And uh, it's a real pain, obviously, to the environment. There's, there's poisons and toxins that are in there. Um, in some cases, there's asbestos that's left behind. And, and uh, in those particular cases, the, the local um, authority have to come along and clear it up. But uh, the landowner is the one who is uh, mostly responsible for doing that, and um, it's a real it's a real pain. And this happens, you know, as soon as spring comes, people do house cleanouts, builders become a lot more active, and and this occurs an awful lot, and it's a real a real nuisance. Um, so uh, just this is a kind of a pub conversation that often happens with me on a Friday night talking to friends and say, well, couldn't we do a Raspberry Pi project to see if we could. Uh, detect the presence of uh, fly tippers or perhaps capture an image or see if we could recognize them in some way. Um, our unitary authority, uh, where I come from, uh, what their response to this is that they will rummage through the debris and if they can find a piece of paper or some way of identifying the culprit, then the most they will do is write them a letter and say, we think you've dropped something. Would you like to come and pick it up? Um, and my friend, who's the local estate manager, is now part of a, a, a national farm awareness group, uh, which has a local a local meeting that's now chaired by a cantankerous um, police official who's fairly near to retirement, and he's of the opinion, if you can just find me any way of identifying who these people are, I'll actually just go and arrest them, uh, which will be a lot more effective than writing them a letter. So with that uh, as background, we think, well, could we do a pie project that would help us try and identify... Um, who these fly tippers are. Now, I'm just going to set expectations now. By the end of this talk, I'm not going to have identified any fly tippers because this talk is actually how I got slightly distracted from this project, <laughs> doing other things. So, um, but, you know, watch this space. And it is actually a little bit of a plea because I have hit a couple of technical difficulties. And if there's anyone who knows anyone who can help me, it, it, would, be, it would be really helpful. So first off, um, we figure that if we want to, I say we, I think it's me, and it's anyone who's listening to me at the time in our house or the pub. Um, if we want to detect the presence of someone, can we just use ordinary PIR detectors connected to the Pi? Um, so uh, on the left-hand side here, I've got a picture of these, these standard PIR detectors you'd have as in burglar alarms. Um, so if you've got a burglar alarm in your house, these are the ones they fit in each room. Now, I managed to get hold of eight of these off a of free cycle. I'm, so I'm just doing my usual scour of free cycle looking for stuff to fill my garage with. And I noticed somebody <laughs> said they were moving house and they had eight of these. So I, I just grabbed them. I, I went around, picked them up, and I had no idea what I was going to use them for. But like many things, I just happened to have it kind of lying around when it came, became useful. So um, I had some of these uh, and I thought, well, th this is good. I'll, I'll see if I can just kind of hook this up to the pie and, um, and detect uh, movement. Um, now, they, they are, the way they actually work is um, you, you have to give them a 12-volt power supply, and I assume that's because burglar alarm systems all run off a 12-volt battery. So you have to feed it a 12-volt supply, um, and then there's a, a, an open circuit which you, you can just detect the presence of, sorry, a closed circuit which you can detect the, presence, uh, the opening of on the Pi using the GPIO port. So um, I, I, and I don't program a lot, so it's this kind of small little Python scripts I'm doing to test this. Um, so I kind of rigged this up. What I did was I ripped the cupboard off of one of our study cupboards. Now, my wife is very patient with me, um, but I, it gave me a big enough board to pull all the pieces out on. So I screwed all the pieces down like this, and uh, I connected these, these sensors up to um, some Cat5 cable and some Ethernet ports, so I could just plug them in and run them out. And that kind of worked, and so I thought what I really wanted to do was test it in a real situation. Um, and this was about, um, uh, I guess this must have been the beginning of October uh, last year. So I thought, well, what I'll do is I'll see if I can detect the presence of children at Halloween coming around our house. Because Halloween's not like it used to be, is it? There's, there's a lot more activity now. So I thought, well, this would be really good. I can just see if I can detect kids and, I don't know, put a, a bit of sound out or something. So, um, so this was distraction number one. So what I actually did, I'll just describe this to you again. So I, I happened to have two stroboscope, strobe lights, which I'd picked up from somewhere some years ago. Uh, and I thought, well, wouldn't it be good if I could kind of turn those on with a bit of thunder uh, as the kids come down the drive, you see? So um, 
so of course that means switching on 240 volts and again this is I know no electronics right but I do know you need a kind of a, a 240 volt relay so uh, on the bottom left there I had to build uh, a 240 volt relay which um, and I don't know if you, the way these these work to switch 240 volts as a coil uh, which I have to activate but I couldn't find one with a low enough voltage for the Pi to work I could only find a 5 volt one so I had to buy another expansion board called the Pi a buy so I purchased this time uh, buy an expansion board with a, a which I could switch five volts with, uh, and then I could switch um, uh, then I could switch the twelve volts that was needed for the for the base uh, relay for this. So I was switching one relay to switch another relay to turn on the two forty volts for the strobe. So uh, so then I thought, well, actually, I could do more than just turn on the strobe, wouldn't I? I, I happened to have a papier mache head that my daughter and I made many <laughs> many years ago with an eyeball hanging out, and so I and. My daughter did a textiles project once at school and had one of these tailor's mannequins, you know, so or the, the, you, you put a dress on. So I put, I thought, I'll have that. I'll put the papier-mâché on the head. And, and then I built this box. About this, it's kind of a small TARDIS-sized box here. Um, so I, I just built a wooden frame, and then I lined it with black cloth. And then I put a, 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 a nylon gauze, a black nylon gauze on the front, and put the mannequin inside, strobes inside. So it's dark when the kids come along. You know, they can't see anything. They finally get to the door. The lightning comes on, and they see this body inside the box. So that's the idea, OK? So that's sensor number two. And the sensor number one just detects them coming down the drive and puts out a scream. So that's actually what I was doing. On the right-hand side here, again, you can't see this very well in this light. Um, you can just see the papier-mâché head. But I, I have got a video here, um, which we're hoping the sound will work on. Uh, uh, so I'll, I'll just say what to look for uh, uh, with the light level. So. The first thing is, there's first PR sensor is going to go off. There should be a couple of screams to hopefully scare them, and then uh, if they make it to the door, uh, somewhere around about um, here, uh, you should see the strobes cut in uh, and the, and the box uh, be illuminated. So um, let's let's see what happens. Okay, so that worked. I'll tell you what was really rewarding about that. We had two lots that ran back up the drive. <laughs> it was, uh, and they were, yeah, really upset, some of them. Anyway. <laughs> you know, I don't want to be ha held to ransom by, um, uh, by trick or treaters. Right, okay, so th that was number one thing. So that was, uh, can we detect presence? And that worked. And, you know, we're still a long way from fly tip cam at this point. Uh, so the next thing was, can we? Um, I'll just see if that's. Uh, can we uh, get get an image, perhaps? Uh, and I wanted to try using the Pi Cam. Now, when I actually started thinking about this, I don't think. The, well, I think the Pi Cam had just been announced. So this is the five megapixel camera board for the Raspberry Pi. Um, so when that first came out, it was just a standard camera, and. Um, the, the, the thing was that we figured most fly tippers will do stuff at night, so what we really need is, is infrared. And um, the, the problem with that is, uh, at, well, at that time, there was obviously a big demand for this, uh, for infrared pie cams, because there was a kind of a meme on the internet of people who were taking the filters off and turning them into infrared cameras, because it, it just has a blue filter over the front. So, um, so I started looking, at it, but it looked like the general success rate was about 30%. So mostly they just knackered the cameras. So you know, one out of every three. So I wasn't really up for doing that because I only had one. And uh, uh, and again, this was another purchase. So I, I, you know, generally I try and get stuff for free, but um, you know, if I if I can, I, I try and avoid purchasing it. So, but anyway, it turns out that there was such a demand for this that the infrared uh, Pi Cam came out, and you can buy the blackboard, which is the the the, the one on the bottom left there. Um, to to just put into your straight into your Raspberry Pi, so I'm getting quite excited at this point because we may get visual, you know, 
Um, so I connected it all up. Um, now, the software you use for this, if you've done any um, webcam work with a Pi, the, the software most people are using is Motion. Um, it's, it's, it's open source. There's a really good one called Zone Minder, which is, which is a lot heavier duty. And you can, um, you can kind of describe parts of your image and get Zone Minder to just monitor changes in those parts. You can do that to an extent with Motion. Um, but Motion's pretty good. It's quite lightweight. You can get up and running, and you can you know, detect various things happening uh, with it. So, uh, so now there is a version of Motion that's been, uh, that somebody's knocked up for, um, for the Pi cam. Uh, so I had to download that. It's a, it's a fork. I, I'm guessing they'll remerge later. Um, but I, I downloaded that, got that going, and that looks pretty, that, that was working quite well. So now I'm thinking uh, I need something to detect, detect motion. And that's really where we get to the subject of the talk. Um, and that is um, that I thought I would, um, oh no, sorry, there's one other bit before that. That's right, yeah. <laughs> Again, rubbish, I'll describe what's here. So my, if I'm going to put this outside to, to catch fly tippers, uh, it has to be weatherproof. Uh, it has to have night vision. Obviously, we're going to get that for the infrared camera. You need to have data access, and it needs to be secure. I don't want people kind of picking it up and walking off with it. So this is where the welding comes in. So I, um, I, I made this. So this, this is, um, so this is a standard army ammunition box. You can get these from army surplus stores or, um, uh, or, or on the web. They're about kind of six to ten pounds, depending on what size you get. So I, I thought I'll put the camera, the pie, and the camera inside this. You drill a hole in the front. Use some. some my wife actually does um, does glass stained glass making. She's really good at cutting glass. So I got her to cut this this piece for the front here. So she contributed to the project as well. So I bought this matrix, this infrared uh, matrix here, to illuminate the area. So the camera comes through the through the hole here at the front, and um, you can access it all via the via the back. Um, they're very secure. Okay, so all the bits and pieces will sit in the back here uh, like this. Now, so here's a top tip, by the way. These, these are really good, these boxes. We use them for geocaching. If you're doing geocaching, you put geocaches in them. Um, but they're, they're airtight, you know, really water resistant. So if you're welding something onto one of these and you have it closed, what you've got is a very highly contained piece of air, which you're then going to heat to 1500 degrees C. And um, if you haven't got your visor on, what you get is a globule of, well, you, either way you get this, you get a globule of steel that comes firing out at your face at a very, very fast rate of knots. So if you're welding them, keep the door open, because uh, I learned that the hard way. Uh, anyway, so that's it. That's pretty, you know, that's all good chunky stuff. And I've built some brackets to put it onto, uh, onto a tree. Um, so I figured that now that I've got my water price, waterproof device, I wanted to just test this. And my best option, I thought, for testing was to do an alpha test on our cat flap. So, um, by the way, on, uh, on the left-hand side there on that picture, there's two solar panels. Now, by now, I've started buying stuff, and this project is going up in price, and I'm really worried my wife isn't going to be very happy about this. But the solar panels was a breakthrough because I realized on Amazon you can just send the stuff to a different address and pick it up later so she doesn't see the stuff <laughs> coming into the house. So that, you know, it's a breakthrough moment that was. So we've got this solar powered, I've got an alarm battery in the bottom of the, uh, in the, bottom of the um, camera there, powered off solar powers. That's actually, by the way, this is one of my... The power management is the thing that's worrying me at the moment. Anyway, I've got a cat flap tested. On the right-hand side, you can see the bottom of our wheelie bin and just see the bottom edge of our cat flap, which is where I place the camera. To what? And I figured I'll just see our cats coming in and out of the cat flap. These are our cats. Um, they're Bebop and Blues. They're two black cats. Um, so my, you know, my objective is it'll be quite interesting to see what Bebop and Blues are doing through the night and see whether I'm actually detecting it. Uh, Bebop is the one on the right with the dodgy eye. Um, uh, and he's the, he's the boy, and uh, the one on the left is Blues, the girl, uh, their brother and sister. Uh, that's enough about my cats. Right, so, um, right, I've got video here, this is, so you might have to squint to look at it. Um, so this was, so I was really surprised. First off, I, I, I ended up with this. Um, I didn't see any motion from our cats whatsoever, but this one arrived. Um, we've called Longtail, suspect number one. Uh, who arrives at the step, you can see, has a sniff around. Now, it's interesting because two days after this, I was uh, uh, 
passed a field that was outside of our village and I saw this cat. It must roam an awful long way. I mean, it was easily a, a half a kilometre away. And this self-same cat was there. Um, but anyway, so he didn't go in. He just had a sniff around, as you can see, and then he walked away for a bit. Okay, so that's, that's long tail, uh, number one. Um, let me just uh, move on. to Right, so the next one is this one here. On the left... Um, oh, hang on. Ooh, let's stop that. Rewind that. Let me just give you the rundown here. Hold on. Ugh. Right. So this one here, uh, on the left there, this is uh, a separate, different cat, a short tail. We called him Stumpy, codenamed Stumpy. And you can see he actually goes up and into the cat. He actually enters into the house. And um, looking at the timestamps, again, motion timestamps all these images. But I mean, the way motion works, by the way, is it just it takes a JPEG and then another JPEG and it compares the two. And if there's a difference, then it starts laying down JPEGs. So all these videos are just JPEGs that have been strung together. Um, but a few seconds later, um, he, um, there we go. he exits on the right-hand side being followed by Bebop, which you can just see there, who comes out. So he, he only stays in for a few seconds, and then Bebop, um, I think, just moves off and sees him off the premises completely. We always knew he was useful, that cat. Right, so that's, so, so I've now found out I've got two different cats coming into, into the house. Which is, and I just couldn't believe this. You know, it's just, uh, how many of these cats in the neighborhood are we fe feeding? So next day, Uh, we get this one on the left-hand side. Uh, oh, okay. I'll describe this to you. <laughs> if only these screens were working, right? Uh, so on the left-hand side, I have uh, another cat, as a ginger cat, codenamed Ginge, who actually enters the house. And uh, in that video, uh, he has just entered the cat flat. But now, what's interesting is that he uh, he stays in there for three minutes. And he exits uh, three minutes later, and we don't know why. There's no bebop. So on the right-hand side, he's just exiting uh, here. Uh, but it's three minutes, and I thought, oh, blimey, so what's he doing for three minutes? Well, he's probably eating the food, isn't he? Uh, so this, this then gave us uh, an idea for another project, um, which this is a work in progress, and let me just describe this to you uh, again, because um, the screen's not brilliant. So top left-hand side, I have a cat flap, um, that um, has RFID detection if, uh, uh, on it. Now, the, uh, th those chips that cats have in their necks, there's a standard for that, and it's a four centimeter uh, field, field distance that you can read. And I'm figuring that we could have the cat flap able to read that. I don't, I, and I don't mind about, they can come in, it doesn't matter, the cats can come in. I just want to know who the cat is. And on the bottom left, there is actually, I've got a description there of a web service you can go to, send the chip ID, and it'll give you the contact details for the owner. <laughs> okay? Now, so I'm figuring the cat comes at top left, the cat comes in the cat flap, Raspberry Pi reads it, it goes out to the web service, it comes back with the contact details. Then, at the middle at the bottom there, uh, you'll see that the, uh, uh, the cat that's entered the house is then imprisoned. <laughs> okay. So we've now got the, uh, we've got the perpetrator in the house. We know who it belongs to, okay? And we've got evidence they've entered the house. Now, the, the top right, we've got the cat food on a lab balance. Interface to the pie. So for that period of time, we know how much food that cat has eaten. <laughs> and what we then do is we auto-generate the invoice <laughs> for the meow mix, which goes straight to the owner. And of course, as soon as it's paid, they can have their cat back. <laughs> so that's... <laughs> thank you. So, so that, that's a work in progress. If anyone wants to help me with that one, let's just get in contact. Okay, so um, right, so I've kind of summarised where I am. Right, you know, I'm able to detect motion. I'm able to detect all the neighbours' cats. This is where we are with fly tip cam right now. Uh, on the left hand side, I have the location where fly tip um, was supposed to be mounted two weeks ago. Um, it wasn't mounted because I have a power management problem. 
uh, which I will describe to you, I don't have any pictures of, but it goes like this. Um, I had a burglar alarm battery in the base of the, uh, of the, of, of, uh, of the module, and um, I had solar power batteries, and I took out the battery and the solar power pan solar panels to scout camp. So uh, I'm chairman of a local scout group. I go and help out at our scout camp every year. We thought it would be really cool to take the battery and the solar panels to scout camp so that all the scout leaders and maybe some of the kids could recharge their phones. Um, one guy came along, as soon as I put a load on the battery, no, this battery, by the way, was inside one of these ammunition boxes. As soon as I put a load on the battery, uh, there was a lot of kind of flickering of LEDs and the battery started expanding like this. Now, we often have accidents on Scout Camp and we have to put them all in the, in the first aid book, but we've never had sulfuric acid burns. So I immediately just slammed closed the lid and, uh, and threw away the battery. So, um, thank you. Uh, so um, I, have to, uh, I have to do something about power management. And basically, uh, this is the, the last bit that I need to put in place. Uh, I really need to kind of get my head around uh, what needs to be done in order to keep the thing topped up with power so I don't have to keep going back and revisiting it. Um, one other thing I did, I did mention um, was uh, that I needed to have secure data access. And uh, we also have... Um, uh, there's, there's a Wi-Fi dongle here for accessing it. And um, so you, it's called Fly, FlyTip Cam is the network and the password, if ever you're there, is get off my land. So this is uh, so. Uh, that's my presentation. I just have this one slide here, which is a picture of it, which you can't see, but it's basically a plea to anybody who knows anybody who could help me with the power management on this. Um, I would be really grateful. My um, my Twitter uh, ID is there on, on that. Um, but with that, that's uh, that that's what we did with her for for cat burglars. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Um, just wait for the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's right. Any more questions? Not so much. Not so much a question, but uh, there was actually a guy doing photovoltaic uh, workshop uh, earlier. Have you spoken to him? Well, I think I'll try and catch up with him. Yeah, I, I'm, I would have done that workshop if I'd been able to. Kind of, they, they were all kind of full by the time we got in. So yeah, yeah, yeah I'll try and catch up with him. Well worthwhile. I yeah. Think get on. Thanks. Any more? All right. Well, can everyone just give us a hand and say thank you to Derek again?